Welcome back to Ty and That Guy. I'm Wes Chatham. And this is my good friend, sometimes lover, Ty Frank. Say hello, Ty. Hello, Ty. Today is, a, is another special day. We're having two special podcasts in a row. But this one is extra special with a little sugar and spice on top. Tell them why, Ty. Uh, because I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> and I make every day special That's just right. by my presence. Well, you're, but, uh, you're, we're, you're special, but then we have special on steroids. I don't, because... I don't like this comparison. Okay. Uh, so we're going to be talking about writing, and we only know one real writer between <laughs> us. So we decided to invite that writer to the show. So uh, Daniel Abraham is going to come hang out with us and talk about writing because he's the only one who could do it intelligently. Yeah. You know. And and we're talking about one of our favorite writers of all time, which if you listen to this podcast, you know somebody that we uh, we just absolutely adore, and it's Stephen King. And we thought of the best way to start with Stephen King is start of his book on writing because it's really a craft of the memoir of how he was formed into a writer. And this would be a good time to kick off our uh, Stephen King series. So yeah, so we got Daniel Abraham. He's never read anything by Stephen King. He's never read on writing. But uh, we've decided to have him come on anyway. He, he's a John so, Updike guy. That's, he's, that's, yeah, he's an Updike guy, yeah, for sure. Yeah, he's an Updike guy. <laughs> I prefer my books more pretentious. Uh, no, that's not, that's not I, 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 I am tremendously pretentious, but I, uh, I love Stephen King. And uh, yeah, I think On Writing is a great book. And, yeah, I think you guys are smart to pick it. Daniel was telling me that he's actually read on writing twice. He just reread it recently. So we got somebody who actually uh, is going to know what they're talking about, which is great. Keep your expectations low, but yeah. It's a comfort book for me. I mean, it's, it's a book I read once a year. I, there's something about, I think that King and I had a, had a lot of similarities. And there's something like when I read, there, there's a reason that I was drawn to him. And I, as I've grown, sometimes people that I found when I was younger, when I grow, I kind of grow out of them. But there's something about King that I just keep going back, going back. And I read pretty much every, if he has a new, he usually has one or two books come out a year. And that's a big event for me. Like, oh, King, King's got one coming out. And then, you know, I'm at, I'm at the bookstore day one, get the book, read it right away. What, if I, whatever I'm reading, I'll drop it for, for King. Yeah, no, I, I, uh, I, I wind up, I don't, I'm not quite as, uh, avid as that, but I, I, I keep an eye out for what it's coming out with. And I'm, I'm caught up almost on his, his recent stuff. I haven't read Fairy Tale yet. I, I, I also haven't read Fairy Tale yet. I'm very excited to get that. I one. really Got liked it. Fairy Tale. I really enjoyed Heard good things it. About, I liked Billy Summers. Yeah. Um, I, was su- I was surprised by Fairy Tale because I was like, ah, oh, you know, I wonder how this is going to go. Just kind of, creating like a, a world as vast as that is and but i really enjoyed it i thought it was a good uh, you know i've got it right here i just haven't got it yet so uh, on writing let's let's talk about uh let's talk about the formation of probably the most popular and best-selling american writer of all time that, i mean that that's pretty demonstrably true right there's nobody even in the ballpark with him in a, as far as america goes I mean, you could make an argument for J.K. Rowling, but she's not American. Well, and there are there were very uh, popular writers, kind of in generations before ours. But you'd have to figure out how to weight them for population or sales or something. I think in our lifetimes, absolutely, Stephen King's the 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 name to beat. And when, when did Carrie come out? That was in like seventy eight or or seventy nine. Yeah, it was it was the seventies. Yeah. So. I mean, this guy has been consistently on the New York Times bestseller list from since the late seventies and continuing yeah. to this point. So, what J.K. Rowling is doing is like in- incredible, but she doesn't have that that length of time under her belt with that kind of accomplishment. No, she also only had one project that really hit. I mean, her her mysteries aren't doing what Harry Potter. Nothing does what Harry Potter did. Harry Potter was a kind of its its own moment. Uh, Stephen King. You know, he writes Stephen King books, but they're all, or many of them, stand alone, and they're, they're they have their own stories that come to satisfying conclusions, and then he goes and does it again. That's a that's kind of a different project than trying to get you know, like some hack who would get like one story across nine books and a book of short stories. Yeah, exactly. Unlike other writers, you know, we've talked about Grisham. And the fact that, you know, John Grisham was writing legal thrillers and then he wrote a book about baseball and nobody cared. Nobody bought it. Right. If you're going to buy a John Grisham book, you want it to be a legal thriller. Daniel and I have talked about this. The fact that Stephen King 
his genre is Stephen King books. Mm -hmm. his, that's what his genre is. When you buy a Stephen King book, you expect to get a Stephen King book. But the, the, what the story is about, it seems like his readers don't care. Because Stephen King also yeah. wrote a baseball book. And it was a number one bestseller. And mm -hmm. immediately was like optioned for, you know, adaptation into film. And I don't think they've made it, but, but, you know, I mean, like it doesn't matter what the text of the story or the, I guess the genre of the story is. Mm -hmm. If Stephen King's name is on it, it's immediately a number one bestseller. It immediately gets optioned for movies and TV shows. It's like it, he, he has no genre. Yeah. Fairy tale is a great example of that because it's a completely different genre. I mean, maybe. Would you say the Dark Towers are kind of books like the first one's kind of in that realm? But Fairy Tale uh, is kind of a departure from what what most Stephen King books that I read. But you're right, Daniel. He has a voice, and there's a characterization like that's his strength and sense of place. And there's a relationship between a, a an older man and a younger uh, younger kid in this uh, that's so moving and so touching. And it's kind of the emotional thrust through the whole story that kind of pulls you along. And he just has a way of creating these people that you have a you know exact you know who they are right away, and then you ha you care about them. You have a sense of connection to them, and then when they go through whatever they go through, you really care. And that's kind of like the conversation we were talking about the other day. We were talking about the other day, Ty. Where we were talking about Christine with John Carpenter, and then you you see like he made Christine, and then he made Starman, or he made. And how one hits all the right beats, just like the other one hits all the right beats, but there's one that you care deeply about. And the other ones, for whatever reason, you just you don't really know specifically who they are. They don't really connect with you. You don't understand why they're you know, evolving, why they're arcing the way they're arcing. And King is really a master at that. I would say, I, I, I would say that is absolutely King's strong point, is he writes some of the most compelling characters in fiction. And... He seems to do it effortlessly because Stephen King can start a story by saying, on the day Susan died, that can be the first line of the story. And so you start the story knowing that Susan is doomed, that by the end of this day, she's dead, right? And within a page or two, you care so much about Susan. You want her to make it. You're hoping she's going to be okay because within a page or two, King can make you fall in love with that character. And that is, that's a gift that I, I, I don't know if that's a gift that can be taught. Like and, and just that ability to immediately make you fall in love with someone. And there's only a couple of writers I know who, who have that sort of, that, that immediate reality of characterization where everybody feels like a real person. Uh, one of the other ones, and, and uh, I think in this way, they're very similar writers. The other one who's like that is, is George R. R. Martin can absolutely make you fall in love with a character. I think what's interesting about that is both George and, and Stephen King have similar career arcs and have similar styles of writing in that neither of them does any outline. Both of them are just sort of you sit in a chair and you start typing and you see where it goes. But both of them have this incredible characterization, and I think that is the backbone of their careers. I, I can't disagree. <laughs> One of the one of the things like reading his uh, the the memoir portion of the book that I you know I felt he comes from a really poor working class background. He's a, I come from a really poor working class background. We both have we both had were raised by single mothers for the most part, and we both had a love affair with movies, but the same type of movies. And when he started writing. He said, you know, for many years, I think he said it wasn't until he was 40 that he was kind of ashamed of what he what he wanted to write, what 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 moved him or the, the stories that he wanted to tell. And it wasn't until he was 40 where he was like, well, this is this is who I am. This is what I write. Um, and I because I remember and we talked a little bit before this, but I remember like, you know, in the beginning, like studying at, uh, you know, with pretentious, you know, acting teachers. Uh, I mean, I shouldn't say, look, I've, I've learned so much and I'm grateful for all the acting teachers that I had, but I remember like in my, my, uh, very first day of class, like they put all every, all of us in a circle and they were saying, why do you want to be an actor? Like what inspired you? And I remember, <laughs> and I remember sitting in this group and everybody was like, oh, I saw this Chekhov play. You know, they grew up in New York and their parents had money and they saw this Chekhov play or Ibsen or uh, Arthur Miller. And, 
And I was in there and I was like, dude, I saw Mad Max on Superstation at like, you know, 11, you know 12 o'clock and at, mid, at the midnight showing. And I was like, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to do. Yep. And so there was a little bit of like, man, am I like, I'm kind of like, <laughs> I'm kind of like the dipshit so, in class. And so I, you know, I, I feel like I, I connect with him in that way. Like he's a, a master entertainer, but he does it through his, 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 he does it honestly through like his taste or what his influences were. Well, there's also something to be said about somebody who really commits to doing low status work. I mean, there, there's a lot of folks who, who, a lot of novelists who are writing books that are m- at least partially there to show you how clever the writer is. Uh, they don't tend to make the best books. The people who are there genuinely out of love and who are writing stuff that isn't uh, the the stuff that everyone's proud of, you know, the 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 horror, the romance, the science fiction, the stuff that doesn't make you look smart because you're writing. They don't have that that Ibsen vibe. That means they're there for love, right? Mm-hmm. Or money. Yeah, and one of the things Wes and I have talked about in in all creative work, it comes up over and over again, is is when you can detect that somebody's being genuine versus false, yeah, because. When, when, when the emotions are genuine, when the storytelling is genuine, when you can tell it's coming from the person's heart, um, that they care about the story that they're telling, that seeps through in every word. There's no way to, there's no way to disguise that or cover that up. And the, the inverse is true. When somebody is telling something for a purpose other than the love of that story, you can see that too. Like, oh, you're, you're, you're trying to tell me how clever you are. I can see, I can see what you're doing here. Oh, haha, yeah, you're so clever. Uh, but you don't, you never connect with it because there's no genuineness to it. Or you're there for the paycheck and what you can, what you smell yeah. is the contempt. I mean, there right. are a lot of people who come into it with contempt for the audience. And I, that's, that's something Stephen King does not do. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, yeah. So let's, let, real quick, uh, since we're already into it, I want to do a real quick thing. So Stephen King's book on writing, ostensibly it's his book on how to be a writer and how, and using his life as the backbone of here's here's how I became a writer. Here's how it, what a writer's life looks like. Here's how you do it. And it is not that thing at all. It is a biography of Stephen King that includes stories about his writing as part of that biography as you sort of travel through his life with him. But if you pick it up and read it, thinking you're going to learn how to be a writer like Stephen King, you are going to be disappointed. It does not tell you how to do that. And much of the advice that Stephen King gives about writing doesn't line up with my own career at all or, or Daniel's or, or the other writers that I know. So, yeah, he's going to give advice in it. All the advice Stephen King gives in the book on writing is advice on how to be Stephen King. And since there's only one of them, that advice is probably not going to be broadly applicable. <laughs> um, so- I, I, but- I'm curious to hear what advice you think doesn't apply, because I, I remember reading through uh, on writing. And I mean, a lot of the best advice is always basic, you know, read a lot, write a lot. Well, so he and I are opposite in two very important ways. He does not see the, the value in outlines. He's like, you sit in a chair, you just start typing, you see where the story takes you. And I think much like George, uh, George Martin has a kind of a deep suspicion of outlines, a suspicion that if you write an outline, you are now trapped by that outline. Yeah. That outline will will dictate everything you do from then on. Therefore, outlines are bad because they'll trap you, right? Yeah. Which does not, no, agree, that's, that's, that does not agree with my experience at all. The no, other one wrong. is that he, he says, if you're going to be a writer, retreat writing like a job. You get up at the same time, you go to your office, you sit in your chair for four hours at the same time every day, and you write as much as you can write in that amount of time, and then you go do your other thing. That doesn't work for me. I, if, I, if I treat writing like a job, if I get up and I sit in my chair at the same time every day, nothing comes out. For me, most writing is done subconsciously when I'm doing something else. The, the, my, the best writing that I do is I've spent five hours in my screening room playing a PlayStation game I played a hundred times before. So my brain just sort of turns off and I'm running around shooting guys and not thinking about it. And then I'll go, oh shit, I know what should be happening there. And then that's when you'll get like an email from me, Daniel. Right? I'm like, mm-hmm. dude, here's what, we, here's what should happen. And here's what, or I'll call you and I'll be like, I figured it out. Here's what they should be doing. Here's why they should be doing it. So his process, which is don't plan anything in advance, but be very sort of like workmanlike in you, you sit in the chair for the same four hours every day. 
is the exact opposite of me in every way, which is that I do outline, I do figure the story out ahead of time, I do outline, and most of the creative work I do happens in the back of my brain while I'm doing something else. Look, and, no, the okay. writing, and the writing is sort that. of just getting that out of my head onto a page. And so if I did what he says to do, I would be very unproductive. <laughs> well, Daniel, you, you kind of have the, you are a work, like put the hard hat, lunch pail, show up at the typewriter at the same time every day, uh, kind of a writer. I have, right? I, have, I have more of that than Ty does, mm-hmm. um, but less of that than Stephen King. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm somewhere in the middle. I always bounce on this dichotomy between drafting uh, something fresh and doing an outline. I, everybody treats them like those are very different things. I don't think they are. Um, I, I think it's different ways of um, imagining your way into the story. And I don't think there's a right way or a wrong way on that one. But I think, you know, I think I've, I've seen what Ty does. I've seen him, uh, you know, have that, that moment of insight where, you know, clearly things have been cooking for uh, months or years to hit this exact right moment. And then it's fucking gorgeous. Um, I've also worked in ways where, you know, you write the first draft in order to see what's wrong with the first draft. And then you fix that. And then you write the second draft and then the third draft after that. And then by the, you know, the, the, there was a, the first book I ever published, the first book I sold and published, um, I wrote the whole thing. I ran it past my uh, critique group at the time and they all said the same thing. They all said it's, it's uh brilliantly written, but I don't know what's going on and I hate your protagonist. And I deleted the files and wrote the whole thing again from scratch. I wrote the book that I remembered instead of the one I'd actually written the first time. So going through and thinking it through by writing a draft is also something I've done. I think those are both, you know, those are all ways to kind of uh, access your imagination and, and get it. And it's just, you know, I, writing an outline is like writing a really short telegraphic first draft. So Daniel's process is very interesting. So I, I, for a long time, I I was, you know, hanging around musicians. I was in bands. I I played music. And in my experience, there's two kinds of brilliant musicians. There are the guys who like, they picked up a guitar at 14. They started playing it. It just clicked in their brain. And they've just sort of been improvising ever since. And it just, you know, they just sit and they start playing and just flows out of them. And then there are the people who picked up a guitar at 14 and went, oh, this is hard. This is complicated. And they figured it out and then went looking for challenges. Like, what's a kind of guitar I've never played before? I've never played flamenco. I'm going to go learn flamenco. And then they focus and learn flamenco. And then they're like, you know, I've never played like like jazz. I want to go learn jazz guitar. And so they build sort of this, this repertoire of things that they have tried. And then the style that they end up with winds up being bits and pieces from all and the, all these techniques that they've learned along the way. And both of them are perfectly cromulent ways to become a guitar player, right? I mean, there are some guys who never took a single lesson in their life and they're absolute virtuosos, right? It's just, their brain just works that way. Daniel is the guy who, whenever he sees something in writing that he hasn't tried to do before, he feels compelled to try it. He's like, oh, I've never, like, you can see Daniel going, oh, here's flamenco writing. I've never tried flamenco <laughs> writing. Let me try that. And so his experience, when you talk to him about writing, there's all these experiments he's done. Like he's tried writing without an outline. He's tried writing with an outline. He's tried writing with like very specific story structure in mind. He's tried writing with no story structure in mind. He's tried writing from first person and second person and third person and omniscient and and present tense and, and past tense. And like every time there's a new writing tool that shows up, Daniel will pick it up and try it. And then so his style winds up being this weird mix of all of them, which I actually really like because I think if I have a gift in writing, it is in just sort of pure understanding storytelling. What Daniel can do is I'll say the story should feel like this. And then Daniel will go, okay, well, if we want the story to feel like that, here are the tools you use to make a story that feels like that. And it is much more sort of like he understands the craft at a much more detailed level than I do. And I really respect the fact that he has always approached writing as a thing that you can learn. And so every time he's presented with a new kind of writing, he'll go and learn that because he wants to add that tool to his toolkit. And going back to Stephen King, I mean, one of the things that I did when I was 
a baby writer and I was trying to figure out what prose was, um, is I'd grab somebody who's writing I liked and I would type up 10 pages of their stuff. I'd actually you know, sit down on the typewriter and transcribe what they had already written so that I would see what it looked like on the page and I'd see what it was like to put those words in that order. And I'd have to really pay close attention to, you know, where they did the paragraphing and, and where they did the, the sentence breaks and all of the kind of the minutia of it and, and internalize that voice a little bit. And I, you know, I did that with Stephen King. I did that with Anne Rice. I did that with a bunch of folks. What's, what's interesting is like, you know, they, they, there was an interview with Meryl Streep and she said, I don't know if I could teach acting. She said, I don't, it's, yeah. it's, it's kind of, it's intuitive. It's a feeling it's on a subconscious level. It comes through. But if people are, are around me for a while, then they will experience how I act and experience my process. And so I think King is one of those intuitive artists like that. And I think the yeah. book is that way of subconsciously spending time with him, seeing how he was formed, yes. seeing what, how he created, because I learn like that. It's like in training jujitsu, there are some guys that are really intellectual and very good at explaining, okay, if this happens in this situation, you go here, this goes here, this, that. And then there's other guys that are brilliant jujitsu guys. And they're like, and you'll ask them a question. And they're like, I don't know, do it to me. And, and with how they respond, you do, you do, do a move to them and how they respond to the move is like, okay, you know, and that's how they teach you. So they're like, oh, you know, they, they won't know until they physically do it. And they're like, I don't know what this is called, but this is what I do here, you know, and they do that. And it's interesting because it's like something, it's like a knowledge that lives inside their body and it doesn't always connect to here. And King to me strikes me as, is that type of uh, artist. And I've worked with actors that can talk about acting brilliantly and they've read the books and they've done this and they, and they might even be great actors. Sometimes they're not great actors, but then I've talked to people that it's so intuitive or you, and you, when you work with them, but you learn more by being in their presence and working with them. than if, in, in, you know, if I was like, if they gave a lecture on acting. So there's also, there's also, I mean, I've, I've read a lot of how to write books over the course of the years. I mean, um, and, I think one of the reasons that On Writing, I think, is actually a really good book about how to write is that it talks so little about how to write. There, I've read a bunch of them that are very uh, done, written by, by folks who have uh, a very clear idea of how, how you go about writing good fiction. Um, and it's all very specific and very precise and entirely wrong. <laughs> and just you know, just somebody who had a really who had an idea that they're very convinced about, and they're gonna they're gonna repeat it in a an authoritative tone of voice until you agree with them. But well, I, but they're not Stephen King, <laughs> you know. Man, not gonna not gonna go there. The I, I, the thing that I liked about reading specifically on writing um, was just kind of the the you know you guys are talking about it the the sense of having a cup of coffee with somebody who's really dedicated yeah. to the craft. Yeah. yeah. That's I I think that's probably more useful than a lot of very careful structural analysis of the ideas of plot and characterization. Yeah, you know, there's a there's a level of honesty to him. All the great yeah. writers that I know are honest in their personally. When you meet them, they're they're true tellers. And I find that you know I I remember you know with studying acting there was these great teachers that I work with. I remember working with Larry Moss, and there was somebody trying to do a scene. And he says, you know, basically, you're not being honest yet about you're you are re already playing a character of who you're managing people's expectations and, and, and you're managing your look and managing the way you want people to see you. And now you're trying to play a character. So you're playing a character, playing a character. And until you really strip that down and know who you are, then you can take those instrument, you can take your instrument and put it into another character. But right now, you're, you're not, you, there's so many lies that you're telling yourself and just who you are. And, uh, and I, th you know, I think that's a great lesson for every, you know, it, it, w if you're not telling the truth and you're not, you don't have something to say, but you're saying something because of a, of a result that it could bring you, then there's something counterfeit to that. There's something that doesn't move the other person. One of the, when I was starting off as a writer, like when I was a little, Maybe writer. Um, one of the critiques I got was, you know, 
there's nothing wrong with your writing that being alive for another 20 years won't fix. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, I, I, and I, I think that's absolutely true. I mean, I, so there are some endeavors that youth uh, makes you better at. Like, if you want to be a gymnast, you better be a great gymnast by the time you're 19. Yeah, yeah. Mathematician. Um, if you want yeah. to be a mathematician, do all your do all your best math work before you're 30, because all yeah. the great mathematicians did their best work before they were 30. Writing is not one of those things. Nope. Yeah, writing and 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 I'm gonna. When I say writing, what I mean is storytelling in general, right. whatever format you're doing that in. I think in a lot of ways, acting is storytelling as well. You're using somebody yeah. else's words, but you're still telling a story. That having been through a lot of shit, that having having felt a lot of different emotions and the causes of those emotions and how you how you worked through those emotions and came out the other side, just having a ton of that shit in the trunk with you changes how you approach telling those stories. And what you're talking about, Wes, so I, I agree with what you're saying, Daniel, they, like you got to have some, got to have a little mileage on you. And some people get that mileage very early. And I'm That's not saying true. you can't be a great go, young writer. <laughs> go, but, go see, but, go, real quick, go see a, a high school, uh, a high school production of All My Sons or a high school production right. of Death of a Salesman. You know, you, you talk about <laughs> brutal and you're like, Jesus Christ, go get your heart broken, kids. Like you have, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you, have you, exactly. you don't under, you, you cannot understand this on in, in an intuitive level, you know? Even with all that experience, what you were saying, Wes, that I'm agreeing with, is you got to be willing to reach into that trunk and drag out the most painful things that are in it and put them on a page for other people to see before you, you achieve what writers are trying to achieve, like genuine storytellers are trying to achieve. Because you got all that shit in there. You got to be willing to get it. You got to be like, this is the most painful romantic thing that has ever happened to me. Now I'm going to write about that. I'm going to put that in a scene for everybody to see and it may not make me look good. I may, I may, it may, it may not be flattering to me when I do that. That's, this is not going to be something where I think, oh, it was so painful to me when she did that. You know, it's like, no, that's not, that's not what we're talking about. It's like, well, what it, is that, <laughs> what is that internal conversation like? Walk me through that because if you're telling the truth and you're revealing those sides of yourself, I mean, that's, that's pretty brutal. And, and you, but on a subconscious level, you're always censoring yourself. So like, do you have a catch? Like you, do you catch yourself and know what you're doing? And saying I know what I'm doing, and and you, what does that conversation look like? I have so I'll, I'll tell you I'll tell you the story about when somebody else caught me on that one. I was uh, writing a short story long time ago. I was took it to a critique group, and a guy who was there named Sean Stewart, um, who is a brilliant writer and a lovely man. And we got around, you know, everybody took their turn at the critique, and we got to his critique, and he said, "Okay, so here's your story." Here's the, the problem with your story is that in the story, there was, there was a guy who was dealing with his girlfriend's um, infidelity. And it's just, the problem is you aren't actually acknowledging the damage that she's doing. And I think you're not acknowledging the damage she's doing because whatever you're pulling from in this, you're not acknowledging the damage that was done to you. And if you acknowledge the damage that was done to you, here's how it's going to fix your story, and then it'll be a better story. And uh, he was absolutely right. And you know, it, th there's that that part of this where you are putting your psyche and you are putting your coping mechanisms and your your understanding of yourself and people on display and. Uh, inviting people to judge it. I mean, inviting people to have their take on it. And one of the, one of the kind of the glib ways that I talk about writing is, uh, you know, writing is the balancing act between, uh, really cultivating a deep understanding and compassion and empathy for people and then also not giving a fuck what anybody thinks. That's tough. Yeah. That's the um, hard part. You know, it, what I think is really interesting is like you read the, uh, the, the chapter where he talks about his alcoholism and kind of really hitting mm -hmm. rock bottom. And, and he's so honest. And, and one of the ways that I see, like if you go back and read The Shining after you read that chapter, and it's a good example yeah. of somebody really putting their experiences of alcoholism on the page yeah. and, and really kind of bleeding into the page and telling the truth and how dark and, and raw that is. And, and the fear he has for what he's going to do to his kid. I mean, that, that was, that, that was a, that's a great book. It's not really a ghost story. Yeah, you're exactly right. Like the fear 
that he has for what he's doing to his kids. And when he talks about the book, you know, I mean, that's the thing that got him sober is like, he, you know, his family, it, one of the great things, which is similar to you guys is, I mean, I, I don't think that this is, you know, you need to stay married to be a good writer. But one of the things he talks about is for him, one of the things that works is that he's been married and stayed married and, and, and basically has a good foundation at home. And that's kind of opposite. Like when I was growing like when I was kind of coming of age, like, it was like the tortured artist was the way to go. Like you need to be, you know, you, you, you need to be drinking, you need to be heartbroken, you need to be in pain. And that's how you do good work and good stories. And then I'm reading Stephen King and he's like, one of the, the greatest things that helped my craft and my writing is, is staying, staying married, staying true to my family and giving up drugs and alcohol. Well, yeah. I think the, the tortured artist effect is, uh, that kind of goes back to being really pretentious, doesn't it? I mean, it's, yeah. it's a, uh, it's a, uh, there's there's that romance of of oh I'm like this and yeah, yeah the fact of the matter is boring gets work done um, <laughs> yeah I I mean and look you know I mean this sounds like we're saying the opposite of what we had said before that you have to have been through some shit but having been through some shit doesn't mean you have to have been an alcoholic or a drug addict it doesn't mean you yeah. have to have you know abused a kid it doesn't mean you have to have done terrible things in order to have some experiences that that inform your writing because the truth is everything is personal right like all all apocalypses are personal so you know having had a conversation with your spouse where they're like if you don't stop doing x i'm going to leave you is as traumatic as anything anyone has experienced and it is very personal and no one else knows about it and it's not like it's not the the big dramatic i was a heroin addict living on the streets of manhattan but but it's just as powerful if you if you analyze it and if you're and if you uh, engage with it emotionally and use it to inform your work, it's just as much pain to be mined out of something like that. So you don't have to have the like I, I was a homeless drug addict and that's why my writing is good. But everybody has things that are as painful as that in their past. The thing you have to be willing to do is examine them honestly and allow them to inform your work. Yeah, that it's it's uh it's the therapy thing, right? The 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 pitfall that that we all get into when we start talking to our shrinks is uh comparing our trauma to other people's as if we don't really have a right to it. As if yeah. you know, you know, somebody else had it worse than me, so I don't matter. Um as opposed to just looking at what's actually on our plate and dealing with that. Yeah, you know, and no nobody nobody gets through unscarred but some people do get through unreflective uh some people do get through without having you know thought about okay you know i really 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 want you know i really 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 want to be the uh the 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 senior partner at my law firm or i really 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 want to get the writing award or, you know, and well, why, why do you really, really want that? Oh, because my dad didn't love me. Oh, you know, okay. Then, then, then you're in good territory. Uh, then you're being honest about something. But if you not, if it's not a thing where you've come to peace with yourself, it's harder. I, my experience and, and, you know, I'm a dichotomist because the way I see it, you're either a dichotomist or you're not. I think there are two kinds of people in the world. I think there are people who examine their lives and really think about why they do the things that they do. And there are people who go through their entire lives without ever doing that. And in my experience, most people are in the second group. Like I, I have many friends that I love dearly that make the same mistakes over and over and over again. And I will say, why do you keep doing that? And they have no answer. They, they, they've never sat and thought about, huh? I keep, I, I keep dating the same kind of horrible person over and over again and ruining my life. And I've never sat and thought about why I'm attracted to that kind of person or why I keep doing that to myself. And every time that happens, I like, I'm surprised by it because I'm so probably too much. I'm the opposite. I'm like constantly thinking through everything that I'm doing. Why did I do that? What does that mean about me? Is that a thing I want to change about myself? Like I'm constantly doing that when I'm having a conversation with somebody and it becomes clear to me that they've never done that. They've never sat and thought about why they're making the choices that they're making. I'm always a little baffled by it, but I would say if you want to be a good storyteller, you, you cannot be a person who never sits and thinks about your own shit. You yeah. have to be a person 
who sits and thinks about your own shit. You got to be somebody who examines why you made the choices you made, why they were mistakes, how you would do it differently in the future, because that becomes the foundation on which you build interesting character. Or alternatively, you can be a absolutely talented, unreflective freak show who puts yourself on display without realizing you're putting yourself on display right. and everybody likes to come and watch the car wreck. I mean, there's, there's, yeah. there are careers like that too, Yeah, but, that, that for, but, for sure. but, but those aren't things you can learn. <laughs> you know, that's, yeah. that's, well, not that's, a, that's, that's the, but, that's the virtuoso jazz guitarist. Yeah. Right? But, but, like, they, yeah. Like you can, yeah. but you can curate that too. If somebody knows what they're doing, they can create, they can curate the, the, the car wreck and they, they know what's entertaining what? and whatever and to people and they, and they, you know, they know what they're creating. And that, and because there was a time where that kind of in the art world, that behavior was really celebrated. And so people would come in and be like, shit, I'm kind of normal. I'm kind of boring. So I'm going to, I'm going to start behaving terrible and tear up hotel rooms and not show up late for work and be drunk, you know? And there are also people for whom, um, their art is their symptom. I mean, if you look at, um, I'll pull up, uh, the, the late work of Philip K. Dick, um, it's brilliant. It's primarily a record of his struggle with mental illness in, you know, the, the guise of science fiction. And it's fascinating to read. It's fascinating to be with. I don't think it's considered or, yeah, coming from a place of wisdom so much as a place of just reportage. That's the world. I also don't think it's replicable. I also don't think it's replicable. I I don't, I don't think it's a thing that a person could learn how to do. Yeah. No. Um, so, so it, it, it is, it's useless. It's, 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 it's like, it's like, it's like watching somebody do a physical performance that relies upon some abnormality of their physicality. Yep. So you're like, that's amazing that person can bend that far or that amazing that they can do that thing. And it's fascinating to watch, but you're not, you can't train yourself to do it. it so, is a, yeah. <laughs> so when you're reading something like on writing or um, the other one I read, the Lawrence Block did a bunch of essays um, for Writer's Digest over the years um, that kind of are in the same genre for me with the Stephen King on writing. It's by people who want to cultivate the craft and want to learn the art and want to become something and are in the process of doing that as opposed to, you know, kind of the art crumbs of writing who just show up and do what they do. And everybody is in awe, uh, but also don't have yeah. a range outside of their idiosyncrasies. Like Lovecraft. Yeah. Um, like Lovecraft. Yeah. He's a good one. You know, I but I do. There's something so endearing about how much he adores his wife and adores his family. In that part in the book, when he gets, <laughs> when he's trying to buy the pink stuff for his daughter's ear, and you know they can, you know they're they're struggling from paycheck to paycheck. And he was an English teacher, and he and they call because Carrie sold, and he he had forgotten. You know, it's been a year and a half since they submitted the movie. And I don't remember the exact amount, but it was a lot of fucking money. It was, was life changing money. It was yeah, life. It was life changing money. money. And he thought, I think it was like, what was it? I don't remember the exact numbers. And Joseph, maybe we can go back on it. But let's just say it was like uh, 50,000 or 250,000 or something like that. And, and he, thought, he thought he was saying like, oh, you mean, you, oh, I got like, he was so excited that he got like $2,500. And he goes, no, 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 $250,000. And, and, you know, and he had to sat down and he was so excited that he wanted to buy his wife a present. And he went to the store and he went to a drugstore. He realized he was in a drugstore, and he's like, "What is the most extravagant thing that he can buy?" And the only thing he could think of was was a hair dryer. So he, he, <laughs> buy, he buys his wife a hair dryer, and she comes home, and he tells her about what happened. And, and up until that point, you know, like she's working at uh, Baskin Robbins, and and he's working as an English teacher. And up until that point, like they were really struggling, and they were you know struggling to even buy medicine for his his daughter's ears. And when she tells him, she just sits on the couch and starts weeping. And it's just such a powerful story. And, and it, yeah. you know, and he's such a good writer and you care so deeply about him when that happens. It's so moving. The, the, story, yeah. the story from it that actually was the one that stuck with me was the story about his desk. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. We yeah. The, tell that story. The great yeah. big. He got, so he's, he's a oh, big, yes. important, fancy writer now. And he gets a, gets a great big desk. Gets the, yeah. the you know, the, the. The, the kind oak. Of Cadillac of desk, yeah, to, to, at which you can sit and be very important and be a very, you know, kind of 
indulged your ego of being that, that great writer. It's a great writer desk and it just couldn't write at it. Couldn't, <laughs> didn't work. <laughs> just like, nah, it's, 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 uh, well, it was also in his drug and alcohol time too. And yeah. when he kicked the drugs and alcohol, he kicked that desk. That desk was a yeah. symbol of, and of, it was a symbol of, of ego, of egotism, yeah. of, That's of it. kind of being, uh, lost in the story of yourself instead of the experience of it. Um, What's great and- is like it's 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 a metaphor for his inner life. When he was doing the drugs and the alcohol, he created this massive desk in oak, and he was like, I was like this, like uh, the captain of my ship on this massive desk. And then when he got sober, the first thing he did was get rid of that desk, and he turned it into a family room. And his kids would come up, and they would do family. They would watch movies together and stuff. And he goes, you know, and so it was almost like denying his ego and really connecting with the thing that is his source and the thing that really matters to him. And, well, and, there's, yeah. and th- I think this is true for, for a, a wide variety of artists. I'm, I'm betting you can speak to this, Wes. There are the people who are really into the process of writing, then really into the, the experience of writing, really into the, the kind of the, the nitty gritty and the, the, the the joy of it and then there are people who are really into being writers um and who are there to work through some kind of personal identity issue yeah. and and a uh, sense of worth and it's less about the craft it's less about the work and it's more about the bragging rights um, yeah, the identity so I always, I always pose this question, like if, if somebody comes up and says, hey, can I have lunch with you, you know, and they tell me that they've dreamed about being an actor or whatever, and I said, think about this question. If there were two Earths and they were side by side and you, you're living as an actor, you would go to this other Earth and you, could, you would make movies, you would make television shows, but nobody in your world would ever know that you did that. But you get to do the process and you get paid uh, you know, you get paid minimum wage. And so you, so you get to do all the great work and work with all the great directors and do all the things that you dreamed about doing, but nobody will ever have seen it that you know, and you will never make more than minimum wage from it. Would you still do it? And, you know, if you think about that and you think about, you know, if, if you think, if the answer is easily, yeah, I would still do it, you know, and I, and I would struggle financially and nobody would ever, I would never get any pat on the backs. I would never get, you know, the, I would, I would never get to cut in line. At never going to be on the cover of a magazine. You're never going to be on the cover of a magazine and everything. Would you still do yep. it? And I think I got this little, I've said this on the podcast many times. I actually, I won't, I've said it on the podcast already too many times so we can, we can go, but I have this little, <laughs> I have this little theory about what LA attracts to it. And when I say yep. LA, I'm talking about, you know, the, the industry of movies and yeah, I, I Well, we've talked about this, and I, I think it bears repeating. I think there are two kinds of actors. I think there are stage actors and red carpet actors. I think, I think there, there are actors for whom the performance and the craft of putting together a performance is the juice. That's where they get high, right? And I think there are people who do that so that they can walk down red carpets because walking down red carpets gets them high. Um, and I think that's and, true on writers. Too. And I, think I think it's true in writers yeah. as well. Yeah, I think, I think there are people who love being able to say, oh, I'm a writer. They love being able to say that. And other people go, oh, you're a writer. Oh, wow, that's cool. What, how interesting, right? That's the juice for them. And there are people for whom sitting at a keyboard and coming up with a really clever turn of phrase or a really great scene or a, or a character that makes you tear up a little bit, that's the juice. And I, I think that is absolutely true. And I, I agree 100% with what you just said about the two worlds question, because better writers than me have said, you're a writer if you can't stop yourself from writing. If, if, if even if nobody's paying you to do it, you're still going to sit down and you're going to write something because you just can't stop yourself from doing that. And I think, I think that is true. But I also think in a larger context, because I am not that person, I'm not a person who feels compelled to write, but I've realized that I am compelled to tell stories. Yeah. And like, like I'm running two role playing games right now with two different groups of people because I am compelled to tell stories. And that is a way for me to tell stories, you know, that, that I'm never going to get paid for. Nobody's ever going to read about it. It's, you know, it's never going to be in a magazine. And this podcast is another outlet for your storytelling. Yes. And I get the juice of storytelling from those things, whether I'm getting paid for it or not. 
And if you, if you, if, if that's the juice for you, if sitting at a keyboard and typing out a story or telling someone else a story, if that's the juice for you, then you're a storyteller. If the juice for you is somebody comes up to you and goes, oh, you're a writer. How interesting. If that's the juice, maybe you're not a storyteller. Maybe you're in it for the wrong reason. Yeah. Well, you there know, are also people who've made their whole careers in self-mythologizing. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's yeah, absolutely true. No, people can do amazing work for the wrong reasons. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Naming no names, but you all know who I'm thinking of. Yes. Okay. <laughs> you know, there's a, I love the story when he was teaching English. The, that was the hardest time that he ever had when he was writing because at the end of a work week, he felt like he was completely wiped out creatively and uh and so he was he was he was having a he was really struggling as a writer even when he was doing the laundry there was something about where he would go do the laundry and he could write work in laundry he could write because it wasn't taxing him intellectually and he liked teaching he liked the kids but it was exhausting that part of the brain that creates Mm -hmm. and so he started carrie and he'd written you know three or four pages um and he felt exhausted and he felt like i don't understand young girls and I don't really know what I'm doing. So he threw it away. And, uh, and his wife came in and she was, uh, and why was in the bath and she, she brushed all the cigarette, uh, ashes off of it and put that and got it on the alcohol bottle. And she's like, I think you got something here. I think there's something really interesting here. And, uh, and he's like, well, I don't really know anything about teenage girls and I don't like the protagonist. And she goes, I'll help you with that, but you should continue this. So my question to you guys, is there ever anything, an idea or anything that you had that you were like, you know what, I'm, I, I just, you lost interest in it. You threw it away or whatever. And then it kind of resurrected and became something special for you in some way. Hmm. Not, I, I've actually had the opposite experience. I had the other, the other way around. There was one story I wrote that was cursed. There was one story I wrote that um, was commissioned by a guy who, who had a, a place he wanted to publish it. And I wrote this story that was, Probably the purest horror story I've ever written. Not terror, not supernatural, scary particularly. Was it Flat uh, Diane? Just no, it was not. Um, this one, this one didn't get published. Um, I gave it to him. He took it to the publisher. The publisher read it and said, "Yeah, this is a great story. I'm not going to publish it." Um, and I passed it around to a few people, and specifically. The women who read it said, this is really well written and it should not be in the world. So that one I have in a desk. That's, that's a, I, I, I sometimes, sometimes shit comes out and it's just not going to be right. I still really like that story. And it's interesting to me that, that it exists, but apparently it didn't need to be in the world. Yeah. That, I, I find that story very interesting. I, at least for Daniel and I working together, um, you know, where, where Stephen King is saying, I don't understand young girls, so I feel like I'm doing this wrong. Uh, for Daniel and I working together, whenever we hit a story point, at least one of us is going to have an insight into it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's not always what you think. It's, it's not. A, so, so I have written a lot of the characters in, in The Expanse uh, that Daniel gets credit for. People just assume Daniel wrote them because uh, they're, they're parents with children. And I've never had kids and, and Daniel has had a daughter. And so they'll be like, oh, Daniel must have written that because it's like so in-depth into that parent-child relationship. And the thing that they don't understand is while Daniel has had a kid and obviously Daniel has had parents, I don't think he's ever had like parent-child trauma um, because... because not, not, not like... Not, not, yeah, Scarlett yeah. is a great kid. Uh, <laughs> Daniel's parents are lovely, lovely people. Um, so when we're writing about like parents who are struggling... And, and the trauma that they can deliver onto their children and the trauma that the children have to suffer uh, with, with parents, I wind up writing those characters <laughs> because, you know, that's that, like, I get that, that sort of traumatic parent-child relationship. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, whenever we have, like, romant- like, a character has to have a romantic failure. That's I have, it The weird thing is, and I say this and people think I'm lying, yeah. I've never had a romantic failure. Like, I've da- I dated a little bit before Janae and I started dating. And it was, and there was always, it was never traumatic. Like I never had my heart broken. Then I started dating Janae and we've been married for 30 some years. And so I've never had that, which is a weird thing because, you know, if you're a human being, everybody's had their heart broken. Right. And I just haven't. 
So Daniel has to write all the so heartbreak those, scenes. Those are all mine. I'm good with those, though. I have uh, some experience there. But, but, the, but the nice thing about the partnership is one or the other of us will have had the experience. So we, we never have that moment of like, I don't understand, like the Stephen King was dealing with. I don't understand teenage girls, so I can't write this story. Well, and We've never really had that moment. And weirdly, we had the teenage girl in the story. And, yeah. and so much of it has to do with you know just imagining that you're in that person's space and you're doing the things this person is doing and thinking about why, if you were doing that, you would do that. You know, if you were throwing a tantrum, why would you be throwing a tantrum? Because we've all thrown tantrums. We've all, you yeah. know, it, it, it's, well, if you were running away from home, why would you be running away from home? What would it, yeah. what would it be like to be that in that space? There's a universality of experience that I think we, we tried to lean into. And I think uh, some other people tried to do it too. And it's not perfect. I mean, I, I do believe that, you know, being a 14 year old black girl has probably got some nuances. I'm never going to get straight, but I also think that it has some things that are actually genuinely in common with me. Um, and I, so when we're doing this, you can kind of try to lean towards the things that, that we have in common that, that speak to everyone. And then Somebody who has actually been a 14 year old black girl can at some point cover all the other stuff that I, I don't know how to reach. Yeah. Well, and I think, I, you know, talking about Stephen King, I think his gift is finding that commonality in yep. every character. Like every character Stephen King has ever written, I think Stephen King loves that character. Yeah. Loves them. Yeah. And understands them at like a chromosomal level. Yeah. And with all their faults and all of their victories and, and all the things that they, they, hate about themselves and love about themselves. He's right there with them. He, he, he loves all of it and, and is compassionate for all of it. So even the most reprehensible Stephen King characters feel like real people. Like you get them because Stephen King gets them. And I think that's what he does. I think Daniel just described what he's doing is he, he really leans into the parts about humanity that we all share in common, you know, irrespective of, of whether we're, you know, doing good or doing evil uh, or, or what our background is. There's parts about being a human that every human shares. And, and somehow Stephen King, his brain has zoned in on those things, locked in on that stuff, and every single one of his characters has that stuff. I know that uh, uh, Joseph was, he has a sick kid, so we got to kind of wrap this up at some point. He just sent me a text. Um, but I, uh, I just, before we do that, I want you guys to talk a little bit about when Stephen King says the road to hell is paved with adverbs. And he goes into <laughs> it about this book. But what do you guys think about that? Is it lazy? Is adverbs lazy? Is it, is it something the language doesn't need? Uh, so like, like every bit of writing advice that you will ever get, it is sometimes true and it is sometimes not true. Yep. Sometimes an adverb is an apology for a bad verb choice. Yeah. Sometimes that's what it is. Yep. Uh -huh. And sometimes the only word that means the thing that you're trying to say is an adverb. And so when you, I, I, I think when you give yourself rules like what Stephen King is giving yourself there is you're making yourself always aware I'm about to use an adverb. Is this really the right word or am I apologizing for bad verb choice? So like you're still thinking about it when people give themselves rules like that and then don't ever you'd like you just live by the rule and you don't ever yeah, like examine yeah. whether the rule is right or not. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's when you fuck yourself up. Yeah. Um, but I think if you're reading the shitty first draft that you did and you realize you used a shit ton of adverbs in it and you go, are there good verb choices, better verb choices that I could make that would take some of these adverbs out? That's probably a good thing to think about. Yep. Does it mean you've never you never use an adverb ever again because you read that bit of writing advice? I think those sorts of hard and fast rules make you a worse writer, not a better writer. Daniel and Ty, do you guys have specific examples? You know, because I, I can always think of like passages that like you see over and over or things that just stick out on your mind that just kind of rub you the wrong way. Do you guys have like specific examples of like a poorly used adverb <laughs> that you've came across? Poorly used adverb specifically. I I think suddenly and very are almost never useful. Mm. I mean, that, that's, there's, I mean, I don't. And having said that, you will find the word suddenly in, I don't know. Uh, in, there, <laughs> and, and, and sometimes, yeah, we use it anyway. 
Um, well, but, I mean, in Stephen I'm, King's I'm chapter against in yeah. his chapter well, against adverbs, he uses he has an yeah. adverb or two in there. <laughs> no, I, I, I mean any any rule is a beginner's rule. Yeah, every rule is a beginner's rule. Every 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 piece of received wisdom is imperfect and uh, has exceptions. I mean, if you're typing, she moved quickly down the hallway. Could you probably replace that with she hurried down the hallway? Yes. And is hurried a better verb choice? Absolutely. But there are times when quickly is the right word. Mm-hmm. I mean, there are times when quickly is the, the only word that says precisely what you want to say in that moment. Being a writer is knowing the difference. Being a writer is being able yeah. to look at it and go, no, this was the right word and I'm going to keep it. If you do your shitty first draft and you go through and you replace every single adverb in it with something else you're probably going to be about 90% right and 10% wrong. And that 10% is going to be glaring. It, it, since we're in Uncle Oren's toolbox, you know, he talks about in the, uh, in the chapter about like his toolbox of things, but he talks a lot about yep. uh, active verbs. And, you know, that's something that I want to understand more, like elaborate on that. Using active verbs, don't use passive verbs. Okay. Uh, passive tense is when you, you're obscuring who's actually doing the... Uh, the action, right? You're focusing on the action and not the person doing it. Uh, mistakes were made. The ball was kicked. I, I I walked in the room with the gun in my hand, and uh, a bad thing happened. You know, it's not it's not it's less powerful than saying I walked in the room with a gun in my hand and I did a bad thing. Yeah. Um, I, uh, although although having said that, and I agree with that. everything da- Daniel's saying. There is a moment where I went into the room with a gun in my hand and a bad thing happened is a fantastic line yeah. to build intrigue. <laughs> yeah, to, yeah that, to build I do. Intrigue. I like that line. Yeah. yeah I, no, I, but I'm just know. saying that there is a yeah. moment where that would be the line you would want because yeah. the, and the level of intrigue you're building in the reader about yeah. if that was the if that was the end of a chapter, you better yeah. fucking believe I'm flipping right. that next chapter and reading it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so the man was as punched in the face. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's interesting. A- yeah. As with everything, these things are always situational. I mean, the whole show don't tell rule. I hate that one. I absolutely that one. situational. Sometimes showing is the right thing to do, and sometimes telling is the right thing to do. And if you are a writer, you you should know the difference. Yeah. And you shouldn't have to have that rule. But it's useful early. It's useful early on. It's useful to, to kind of, as you're finding your voice, as you're finding who you are as a writer, as you're finding what the text is that you like, um, it, it, there are some things that kind of steer you away from the breakers. Uh, and then, then you got to let go of them. But Daniel, we were talking about uh, A Secret History by Donna Tart, how... A lot of the action was being told in the room when they were telling what happened. We're like, well, why couldn't we have been there when that cool thing was happening? Why, you know, it's like we're missing all the great events and they're having conversations about it in the room when they're getting hammered, you know? I think Donna Tart and I have uh, some some different views on uh, depicting the plot rather than reporting on it after the fact. (laughs) Um, All right. So. Now that we've completely lost our eight viewers <laughs> by talking about the mechanics of writing, <laughs> we should wrap and this Donna, up. And Donna, who's not going to watch anymore, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> Donna's out. She, she's yeah. a huge fan too. She was a huge fan. I, yeah. She was. Yeah. Yeah. We yeah. we just lost we just yeah. lost Donna's uh, Patreon Blue subscription. Day. I know. I, look, I'm a. I think she's a brilliant writer. I mean, I think she's a really great writer. We're talking about one of her. It's too late, yeah. man. She's gone. Don't yeah. let her go. She's all gone. All right. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> sorry, Donna. I'm reading your other book, <laughs> but okay, maybe it's, I don't know. I think I think we should have done a top five Stephen King books before we leave, but poor Joseph's got to go tend to his, his little girl, so probably need to wrap it up. All right, thank you, Daniel Abraham. Daniel Abraham had zero sons. <laughs> and, Not one had Daniel <laughs> Abraham. Um, <laughs> Uh, all right, love you guys. This was a good time. Thank you for coming out. Good seeing you guys. Yeah, good like and subscribe. You. Sorry if the, the 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 mechanics of writing got a little bit too uh, <laughs> too <laughs> too deep. But uh, all right, guys, say goodbye, Ty. Goodbye, Ty.
that guy.